little flashback day. I was over at my parents' house and my dad pulled this trimmer out of the garage. Weed eaters, I call them weed eaters. Some folks call them weed eaters, some folks call them line trimmers. Um, the reason I'm excited about this particular trimmer is a long time ago, it seems like. One of my first mechanic jobs, I worked at a small engine shop and it was a dealer for Shindawa. I probably repaired uh, two or 300 of these things under warranty. And uh, this particular model, uh, 242 and larger, the 271 and 272, unbelievable power for their size. Uh, and they were pretty expensive back then. If you happen to have one of these, I'm probably gonna cover the most common problems with these uh, during this teardown. Uh, this one has just been sitting, so nothing's really wrong with it. And it's a good example to show you the things that I'm talking about. And let's see, this model is, I always look at the sticker right here to get the date. This is back before the EPA put things like catalytic converters on two strip trimmers, or before they put valve trains in there. A really simple workhorse machine. They finally made gas engines so bad that we had to abandon them. And I think that's the plan. What replaced it was an electric weed eater. You know, no one saw that coming. A lot of the landscaping companies back when uh, I worked on these, they just buy one every year. That way they always had a trimmer to repair under warranty. So they never paid for service. There were a few things that would tear them up. What I'm gonna do is look this one over. Of course, it's a great example of what it's supposed to be like. Talk about the things that I would do every time one came in and I would do an audit and fix it up for someone. And I always started down here. Oh, it's in such good shape. This guard's still in place. It's the first thing a contractor would do. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Zip these off, throw them in a pile. Run the line twice as long as it should so they could work quickly. Well, the downside to that is this engine was tuned for this being a flywheel. Like the, the length of this was the amount of resistance that this engine needed for its proper tuning. Just past the, the end here and make both pieces equal. That kept the whole thing from vibrating, from shaking apart and running slow and bogging. Because this is where most of the problems start. This is where uh, everything failed first. This gearbox, that is the Achilles heel of these Shindella weed eaters. No engine is exempt from someone misusing that. The gearbox uh, might have been a little weak, but it's hard for me to say. I've never seen one worn out that still had the guard in place. It would cut through grass with the line, you know, sticking out to here. Just make sure that this gearbox spun freely. One that was seized up, you'd know right away. It'd feel ratchety or clicking in a way. Before we remove the gearbox, I'm gonna loosen the nut on the side. Some of them are Allen and some are 10 millimeter. We just loosen that enough because that's where our grease is gonna go. We'll set that aside. Metric four millimeter. We're gonna break this one loose and back it out. When you're doing your service, always check this gearbox for tightness. They will start to work loose and they'll flop around on here. And I've seen lots of these shafts that were tapered from the gearbox spinning in place. Uh, occasionally, I would try to rebuild one. There's like a little pinion gear in there that meets another gear. And um, <laughs> there's just two bearing stacks. And you know, look at a parts diagram and you'll see it's very difficult to get a part and labor is so high. We kill it if it was out of warranty. Just backing these off. So I'm just going to slide that back here, get that out of play, I'm going to wiggle this off. See how tight this one is. It, that's just, it's brand new. It's barely been used. If you're looking at the difference between a 272 and a 242, here's one of them. The shaft is larger on the 272. Now, these splines getting stripped or these breaking, it usually stripped the clutch and it was because this was all loose, you know, and it would have like slack in it. If everything's tight, it doesn't have that momentum to work like a hammer. So now that this gearbox has been removed, you can really feel how smooth or rough they are. 
and not bound up with any drag, you know, any drag, running any drag on it. So we're gonna shoot our grease in there, just a couple pumps. Put the screw back in there. And we're gonna put this back on there. If this is sticking out too far, the pro shafts notch into the clutch, which we'll open in a minute, but you'll see, you just kind of have to keep going until it fits. You could grease this also, grease this tube at this time. Other than loading line on here, um, there was a way to hold this head from turning. There's a hole there you can line up for a pin, you know, and now you can, remember it's left hand thread, so to remove it, you go right to remove it. Okay, we'll put that back on. Your heads may be different. In this housing here, there's a pair of shoes that sling out. When the RPM increases, those shoes sling out and grab the clutch. So we're done from here to here. Let's flip this thing around. I'll show you the next things. There was an occupational hazard being a landscaper in the vibration that was transmitted through the handles. A lot of these heavier ones had a rubber cushion here. Uh, that's all the rubber, obviously. Just age is gonna, there's a cut on this one, it's starting to split and as good a shape as this one is in, it's still that rubber would start to twist and it's, it would get fragile, you know. Uh, this area right here, after a lot of use, this cable, it actually goes to the kill switch wire would ground out on the handle here with the red wire and the black wire. Unplug this connector right here. That was to the coil. You ground the coil to kill it. So if you open it right here, there is no ground and the kill switch is not going to work. One day that's gonna be a problem with this one. They were a problem when they were new. You know, this, these rubbers would get damaged. That's either on the trailer, you know, throwing them around, putting them in a big pile and digging them out. These switches would get broken also. Uh, down is off, up is on. That's a safety interlock. This one still works. So we've covered it from here down. The engines are great. The only real way to tear these up would be run them hot or run them in the wrong mixture of fuel to bog them too long. Sometimes I'd see no air filter, that's no good. Carburetor settings, people get in there and screw with them. Mess with the exhaust pipes. I, I saw it all, man, I'm telling you. First thing another contractor would always do is pull a screen out of here, the spark arrester, they clog quite a bit. The muffler, it was really bad on some other models, but if you didn't leave this exhaust ejector in the way it's supposed to be, you'd build heat above the gas tank here and melt it. The uh, hedge clipper by Shindalo was real bad. I kind of remember a uh, recall coming out that was a different exhaust gasket that curved and covered that area. The thing about running the line too long is uh, it bogs it and you'll completely heart attack the exhaust pipe. If I had no idea the condition of a trimmer when it came in, they said it wouldn't run, this is where I would start. Because this could tell you if it was worth fixing or not. And start with this bottom screw. It was in aluminum, sometimes they would get uh, stuck same with these. These go into the cylinder head. Hopefully it would be running when it came in and you could get it hot. And these screws would come out easier. Oh, we got, it. We got away with it. If you can see down in there, these will be sometimes almost completely closed with carbon. So what I would do is clean that carbon out. I put the piston in a position where that won't fall down into the cylinder. I take a plastic scraper and just clean that up. I'll show you just how much I got out of there. That, stuff like that will come loose. 
and score a cylinder. Else, when that muffler's off, is you can look at the piston as it goes by and look for scratches. And when the cylinder's down, there's your rings. You can look into the cylinder walls. This thing is in good shape. I'm happy with that. These bolts here. It's gonna go here and here for the next guy, the next 22 years. Uh, keep in mind, you don't want to really smoke down on that. They're kind of soft, the aluminum head. So I don't know what the torque value is. I never knew that. We're talking about weed eaters here, not airplanes. So I'll take the top off. We'll do that first by removing the spark plug. We'll go get a spark plug wrench. Knock that loose here. Wash is high quality. Uh, we got a nice tan color. So I knew that this was tuned correctly at some point. Put the plug back in the boot. We're gonna check for spark. Ouch. Oh yeah, we're good. Remove this forward screw. The 272 had two screws here, two screws in the rear. The 242 and 231s had just the one up front. It's real tiny. It goes into the coil. So be careful. It's a tiny one. Just one on this. I'm sorry I was wrong. I thought it had two here, but it's just one. Yep. There we have it. Make sure all the grass is out of here. The air gap between this coil. Make sure it's correct. And uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm just talking about the... Part of this flywheel is magnetic, and you can see, you know, how it's magnetic right there. That gap in these metal pieces needs to be there. Thirty thousandths on this thing here. I'm guessing thirty thousandths. Just make sure that gap is there. A weird one if it uh, runs fine cold and then once it's hot it quits running dude put your allen wrench down here and make sure that the cylinder is tight to the base gasket you see that come loose a lot the 231 only has two screws uh, and anything larger gets spoiled There we have that loose. You can see here, two piece clutch. Very rarely does anything go wrong in here unless you lose one of your clutch shoes and it chews it up. Um, you can see the amount of material that's on this clutch. These are brand new. That spring in the middle on a 242, 231, there's one spring in the middle. If that spring breaks, and they do break, the head will turn at idle. There'll be no adjustment on the idle that will make the engine and the head not turn. And sometimes if you stall, if you stuck the head into the ground when it was running and it stalled the engine, that's an indication that this clutch is not disengaging. That spring should be super tight. Earlier I mentioned that gap. Something I would check that gap for is if this bearing on this side or out and that seal was torn up, this would wobble. And you could feel the crankshaft moving and sometimes it would hit this. So if that gap was non-existent, it'd be the magnet pulling the crankshaft over that way. And you would know that the crankshaft bearings and seals are bad on this side. But this one is perfect. There is a bearing on the other side of the crankshaft that's under the pull rope cover. You can shake the flywheel and see if it's ever been hitting the magneto. If that gap changes as that flywheel comes around, that's a good indication that your crankshaft bearing and seal is bad on the front side. But other than those two crankshaft bearings, that was a rare occurrence. That other side of the engine hardly has any load on it. So we'll put this back together. 
inspection looks good there. Let's pull this rear off just to look. The last two screws out of that gas tank skid plate. Dropping that down. Our rubber's holding on good there. Uh, for a period, you could buy this part for Shindawa, the whole thing loaded, rope and everything, uh, new pieces. I think it was like $46, and then later, 26 bucks on Amazon or eBay. But, uh, you know, I never really got into rebuilding these. This screw is so fiddly. If it's too tight, it doesn't work. If it's too loose, it doesn't work. If you put too much line on there, it doesn't work. If you put too loose, dude, just replace that, you know, and it's $65, $75 an hour. I think the customer appreciates that too. It did always bother me that you didn't get the sticker. And uh, you know, that's the easiest way to tell what model it is. I think I'm ready to put this cover back on. We've got a good look here at the insulator between the carburetor and the cylinder head. Sometimes the carburetor would get loose and tightening these screws would not fix that. You'd get a vacuum leak here and they would start on choke, but they wouldn't run with the choke lever off. You'd always need it closed just a little bit, you know, to create extra vacuum. You're fighting a vacuum leak and uh, really the, there's just a few places to look for a vacuum leak on this weed eater. That was, uh, we mentioned earlier, the forward bearing seal on the crankshaft, the rear crankshaft seal, that base gasket, and then the insulator. If you had any other place, there's really no other place to have a vacuum leak, but the case halves could theoretically leak, but I, I never saw that. Never saw the case halves come loose. So here we are, like I was gonna say with that insulator, it's a lot more work to get to the cylinder, but you can see down in there and see the piston and see that it's nice and clean. You can see the connecting rod and all that through this hole. But I saw enough of these to know to check the insulator, make sure that these are tight. Okay, if you tighten that too much, you'll crack that. It's like phenolic plastic. But yep, checking that while we're in here. Now's a good time to check our fuel lines and just pop this whole grommet out. I'm being careful because it's 20 years old, but uh, this is how you replace the fuel filter or the fuel lines. You just pop the grommet out from the top of the tank. The fuel filter is weighted. That's very important that that be weighted. This needs to go to this corner of the tank. So if you're running the weed eater flat, it's picking up fuel from the corner. If you've got the weed eater up on its end, it's still picking up fuel. It, it slides around in that tank like that. Sometimes you'll see some that run great level. You turn them upside down and they start to die. You turn them uh, all the way forward, they start to die like you're edging or something. Um, just make sure that it has a weighted fuel filter. That's probably the biggest part. This fuel line does not look cracked. I'm gonna keep using that. Uh, vents. I never had any problems with those clogging. It's possible. And I'm just helping it go back in with a screwdriver. I skipped the carburetor and that's a major component that uh, you end up in if you're really into a trimmer deep. If it's been sitting a long time, you're going to end up in that carburetor. Before I ever put a wrench to a carburetor, I make sure that everything else is good you have no vacuum leaks your fuel lines are perfect your primer bulb doesn't have a crack in it you know find that original symptom that uh, has changed because your carburetor settings they don't change not on their own that diaphragm that pumps fuel from the tank to the carburetor it gets stiff and it doesn't pump fuel anymore trimmer will start and run with the choke on you take it off choke and it starts to die like it's running out of gas and you go through the whole prime and start up set up again and it runs that's one of the symptoms of a fuel line issue carburetors are cheap for the price of a replacement ebay chinese carburetor you're offsetting the cost of going into your stock carburetor and a gasket kit is not cheaper it's actually probably 35 bucks say in the repair industry a common thing is to replace a carburetor for that reason you're looking at labor cost of tearing into something and still missing it as thorough as you can try and be as a technician. You still end up missing stuff in carburetors and have to go in two or three times and you wouldn't want to get the bill for that.
front of the bulb until it's firm. Give it a few squirts extra. Flip up the choke. This way is run. That way is off. And I take, I take the choke off after it runs that much. That's a good indication that your pickup tube is in the right place. 